you know, privacy and security is not a, uh, it's a chronic condition you treat, not a project you complete. That's a nice phrase. That That's my thing, if I can ever remember to say it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 416 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs, and joining me is Donna Grindle of Carden and a special guest today... We have Josh. <laughs> so, so Josh, you're not uh, you're not uh, a new guest. You've been on before, Josh Corman, and uh, we'll get to Josh in just a minute. Uh, but uh, Donna, anything going on in your world that you can talk about? Should I say? <laughs> nope, nothing I can talk about. <laughs> I didn't think so. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Had a pretty harried few days, but nothing I can share with the world. Um, I'm fine though. I'm good. So if you can share something, it would be potentially be careful about email stuff. (laughs) Don't put, don't put PHI in email period. I don't care if it's (laughs) encrypted and you got MFA. Don't put it in there. (laughs) There you go. That's all I got to say. Yeah. It'll get you in trouble. Mm-hmm. The other thing that's bad about email, and John, you and I have talked about this before, is that email is no longer email. Email is also the perpetual storage solution of everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 20 years in of email in an inbox is is 10 gig inbox is torture. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a problem. So, but to talk about a lot of other problems, <laughs> we're going to <laughs> pull Josh in in just a minute. But uh, I want to thank all of you folks that are helping to keep us on the air and the 20 million listeners we have now, as I always say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks for the donors that uh, to help us as well. All right, let's get to Josh because we got a very interesting conversation to have with him and and his well, viewpoints. We had to stop to start recording it because it would just <laughs> it just kept going. Yeah. So we've had him on before and, and it was a very good conversation. So we're going to have another one and talk about some of the things that he's seen in the sector and some of the problems that are out there and some of the solutions that potentially may work. And Donna, you and I are always talking about what what might work. And it's a constant question that sometimes we have answers to and sometimes we don't, <laughs> but it's, it's a target that is constantly moving. So with that, welcome, Josh. Hello. Thank you for having me back. Absolutely. Well, when you so, were with us last, you were with CISA doing your yeah. contract. So who, who are you with now? Yourself? Well, I have a lot of hats, but I'm probably here speaking in a personal capacity today. So... Let's see, just in full disclosure, founded I am the cavalry.org nonprofit of hackers trying to save lives almost a decade ago. August 1st is our birthday. Uh, served in the 405C Congressional Task Force for Healthcare and Industry Cybersecurity. I know you guys help on 45D, which followed it. Uh-huh. Uh, spent 18 months trying to do emergency service for CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, to design and implement the CISA COVID Task Force, mostly to keep hospitals safe. It's a lot of intense hand to hand combat during peak ransomware disruption, and just do a ton of public policy stuff. And I think you also know my collaborators in the Cyber Med Summit, the mm-hmm. 501c3 nonprofit called, where we do ER hacking simulations with physicians and hospital administrators. So um, all those things cooking along. I do have a day job in Clarity Cyber Safety Strategy, where I do a lot of public policy stuff and help work on industry standards like SBOM, software bill materials. And I think last since last time I saw you, I think I had testified or was about to testify for the Senate on healthcare, cybersecurity, loss of life. And since then, the Patch Act has now passed in a federal law. So we now have minimum cybersecurity hygiene in statute mm-hmm. for the Food and Drug Administration to make sure all new medical equipment, whether it's being sold to large, medium, small, or rural, is safer than it was before. So it's going to take a while to drain the swamp, but really proud to see that bipartisan political will after nine years of trying uh, to get mandatory minimum cybersecurity into the medical devices we deploy. Oh yeah. The medical devices were ignored for so long. And yeah. uh, that, and that's, I think one of the, one of the ditches we're in trying to figure out how to get ourselves out of with all that legacy equipment. Right. Yeah. In fact, um, 
it hasn't ha- it's I think it starts tomorrow, depending on when you're posting this is probably gonna be later, but uh there's some five year strategic planning going on with public private partnerships and they've invited all of us four or five C alumni back. So we're gonna have some kickoff meetings on the five year strategic plans. But I think in the midst of it all is part of the reason I reached out to you, Donna, was I'm really concerned about the state of healthcare cyber, specifically in small, medium, rural, the target rich cyber poor. And they're just getting taken a beating and some of them aren't aren't getting back up. Mm-hmm. And we have a some bipartisan political will in the House and Senate. We have the White House on board. We have total alignment that the status quo is not good enough. Almost everywhere. But but we also have to have empathy for the sector and the people in these positions who have constantly had to beg for, scrape for executive support and budget to do any of the security they're doing. So I think we're in a really dangerous moment because while we have political will, there's really two camps that are formed. There are those who are certain we're doing the best we can. And there are those that, are, that know we're not. And in that latter camp are myself, Congress, White House, et cetera. And we want to see some really bold, creative thinking on how to make sure that the trust we place in our connected medicine is worthy of that trust. And right now we don't have mandatory minimums, but we also don't have the money to meet them if we did. And, um, we have their attention. We have their focus. We just need to make sure we're we're identifying, doing things that can really buy down risk and keep America's hospitals up and running. Well, and I, I like to say that there's actually a third camp that yeah. says we're we're making them do too much. Hmm. You know, <laughs> well, I'm and, not in that camp. I'm not. <laughs> we aren't either, but <laughs> okay. we are the ones that battled that camp. Okay. And uh but that that comes down as you get smaller and smaller the the you know so the hospitals live in one environment where we all need the hospitals. Yeah. And so many people just make this assumption the hospitals are going to be available and and I think we've already before we started recording the we talked about hospitals closing everywhere we've seen it here there's big controversy here in atlanta where i am of one of the health systems closing down one of the hospitals that they had purchased yep and and how that limits access to care and this is happening but to have it happen in part due to a cyber attack only makes it harder for us to face the damages no matter how hard we work trying to get the industry to protect itself. And even between me reaching out to you saying it's really important we talk and and push through some uncomfortable truths and competing truths and how do we acknowledge everyone's truth, but, but, and move forward in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the closure of St. Margaret's really hit me like a ton of bricks and it's not, you know, it's debated when people talk about that instance, like, well, maybe that's not the best example, or maybe there were other problems. Let me let me abstract it in a minute or less without even mentioning cyber, and then I'll lay it, I'll layer it on. So I think what I was going to say has changed in light of seeing this St. Margaret's debates. But essentially, even before this particular news story, we saw about 200 minimum rural hospitals close in the U.S. And I take as an article of faith that time sensitive conditions like heart and brain, where minutes and hours are difference between life and death your timely access to patient care where you need it and when you need it are you know affecting the outcomes in a material way irrespective of cause so if we're starting to see large chunks of the US without an urgent care facility within an hour or more or 3 hours or more of where you live um this affects and worsens outcomes and even affects loss of life so it's troubling that through financial erosion and constraints that these hospitals are closing for a number of reasons. The pandemic made it worse because there were low margin. Uh, you couldn't do the high margin procedures that could fund your coffers. A lot of them are running with one to three or four weeks of cash flow on hand. Some of the additional monies from COVID went away when the pandemic was declared over. And the, the availability of staff has driven nursing costs and traveling nursing costs is way up. And the affluent neighborhoods can afford that. And the, the small medium rurals can't. So we have some real toxic soup of um, financial strains that are making it tough. And for the ones that didn't close, maybe they were bought by larger healthcare networks and strip mined or put on life support and they're canceling services or moving people around. But the timely access to care has been on the ropes for quite some time. Now add in a man-made hazard, 
And that man-made hazard is hyperconnectivity. And what we're seeing is at this current state, predators are hitting 700 plus ransoms per year of these already financially strained hospitals. And while it might not be the single largest contributor to the strain, it, it may be a minor contributor, but it's material enough to put you down for the count. And whether you agree if that's what happened with St. Margaret's or not, if you've got one to three or four weeks cash flow on hand and a typical ransom is going to shut you down for six plus weeks, we have a man-made way to guarantee knock down more hospitals. And I'm not comfortable with that. So question be kind of becomes independent of whether it's one of the ones on the ropes or not, you know, with it's hard to make people care about let's spend the minimum necessary to ensure resilient, reliable hyperconnectivity when you're not even sure you can pay your bills or you're, when you're already like facing down some predatory m a so the, the large ones are okay they're absorbing weathering this and they can get insured smaller ones if you think you might be able to cover this rainy day fund with like some cyber insurance some of the cyber insurers have exited uh, healthcare, or it's cost prohibitive it's like eight times as much for half the coverage or if you do have to make a claim good luck getting it paid through exceptions and exclusions mm -hmm. so it's really really not a good time so we, what we we raced to add the connect the benefits of connectivity and connected medicine, but we're now starting to see the cost rear their head, and it's a cost that you know we can't bear. And it's like, what's more expensive, being you know investing in the the assurance the, the uh, high availability, resilient performance and assurance of your hospital with this new benefit of connectivity, or shutting the doors? And it's both. That I both believe them when they say we can't afford it, mm -hmm. and and I think and we can't afford not to. So this is a an unsized risk and an unsized cost of doing business. And independent of the cyber disruption, we were already seeing far too many of the nation's hospitals close. And now like how many more are at risk while we're wondering what to do. So this window where you finally have political will and attention in Congress, the White House, and elsewhere, like this is our, I think this is our singular shot to change our fate. And you know, some people are arguing for, well, what's affordable, and I'm, but it won't be meaningful. And other people are saying, well, what what would meaningfully protect hospitals, and it's not affordable. Mm -hmm. And I'm urging that people identify what could actually maintain resilient, safe performance of hospitals first, and then we we make sure that the carrots and sticks are there to support achieving that. And quite a few people in Congress feel the same way. They want to make this as important as Sarbanes Oxley. You know, like board level attention, mandatory minimums, audits. And yeah, the let's like. let's talk about that a little bit because some of the folks that uh, that listen in on our show are not they're down in the weeds of doing healthcare work, and they're not really familiar with you know everybody knows that financial systems have stricter security than healthcare systems, which that statement alone yeah. is horrifying. <laughs> But the requirements, uh, let's let's talk about what kind of requirements they face versus because, I mean, I one of the things I've never forgotten is sitting in on one of the HIPAA panel discussions at some conference. And there was, a, I don't know, Bank of America, one of those kind of folks there, part of the conversation. And, and everybody was arguing about two million dollar fine and a four-year corrective action plan or something like that being enforced and this guy raises his hand and he says where i come from in the financial world mm -hmm. we'd be happy paying two million dollars because right. it's usually 20 and four years would take any day because it's usually 20 years and it was like the whole room was like nah you know it's the difference. Well, and famously, chief financial officers face criminal penalties. Right? There's, there's accountability, right? right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not a big fan of regulations. One thing I'll say broadly without make, making this whole conversation about Sarbanes-Oxley is any modern industry with potential to affect public safety, human life has some minimum cyber, excuse me, minimum hygiene regulations. It could be seatbelts have to be in cars, minimum sanitation codes for kitchens at commercial restaurants pre-flight checks for aviation, if it can kill you, it has mandatory minimums, except for cybersecurity. And that's slowly changing. We saw the, the first glimpse of that with the Patch Act for medical devices. But in Sarbanes-Oxley's case, it was Enron scandal and the accounting shenanigans that shattered institutional trust in banking. And you can't have the market work if people don't trust the financial accounting, general accounting practices. 
So it became an existential threat to institutional trust and the government responded in kind. So when you have something like healthcare, which is 20 plus percent of GDP and every American needs to be brought into the world, cared for while they're still alive and, and taken out of the world humanely, like this is too important in history. We have more incentive to have a corpse of their privacy intact through OCR and HIPAA fines than we do for keeping patients alive. Mm -hmm. And I think the recognition that this is not caught up, we were so enamored with the, the benefits of connectivity, we haven't really baked in the costs and the minimum hygiene requirements. So you're going to see something. The question is, maybe the only thing, I think my concern now is maybe the only thing worse than no regulation for minimum cyber hygiene in hospitals is um, the illusion or the facade of, of or bad regulation, right? So like, if we're going to do it, let's do something that can meaningfully identify and buy down risk. Um, and if we're not going to do it, then I think we're going to pay for it in other ways, such as hospital closures. Well, and hospital closures lead to patient death and, right. or, or more complicated illnesses because they aren't treated as quickly. Yeah, I mean, um, later care is worse than care, worse than outcomes. Yeah. And I think last time I was here, I think we had published the first statistical proof of loss of life, that ransomware yeah. could disrupt yeah. and delay hospital strains uh, sufficient to drive excess deaths. Well, and then the one we we also briefly mentioned before we got on was that the the JAMA, that, and yeah. I don't remember, David and I did talk about it on an episode recently, like shortly after it came out, but understanding even when there's other things in the area mm -hmm. you know even with a small practice in oklahoma there was a case where an allergy clinic got hit with ransomware didn't have a plan to communicate with anybody and had just a piece of paper on the door saying mm -hmm. we're closed and all of the other allergy clinics no warning started getting all these calls so that overflow happens and take that times a bazillion in a hospital environment yeah, you might remember, I think we you know, we probably talked about the University of Vermont Medical Center ransoms. Yes. It was recently, ABC did a short piece, like a seven-minute piece on mm -hmm. CyberMed Summit and UVM and a bunch of other things, including the JAMA article. And um, it, it brought it flooding back to me because I live in neighboring New Hampshire. And all of their UVM equipment and, and offices being shut down drove a lot of overflow into the state of New Hampshire. So a lot of my friends and family and, and citizens had even longer wait times as a result of trying to absorb that overflow. So you know, the people, the people that need care, they're going to have to get moved somewhere else and it'll be later and worse than if they got it where they, they needed it. So I'm glad to see that that JAMA article showed that it's not just the victim of ransom, but the cascading effects and the blast radius of nearby facilities that have to absorb that and how yeah. well they do or don't absorb that. And it, it's so a closure has a similar impact because it's right. closed, but this is now not temporary. Right. This is permanent. And private medicine is not going to fill that vacuum. They're going to say, hey, there's lots of jobs going into Austin, Texas. So maybe we'll build more hospitals in Austin, Texas. But if they see a closure somewhere that they don't see is financially lucrative, those people are just going to suffer. Well, and that that's where everything does become complicated in the United States and Mm -hmm. You know, the wait times are are becoming a big problem. I live in Atlanta and I have yeah. problems with wait times right. and finding physicians. You know, oh, I can just roll the dice and pick somebody out of the book. But I'm, I've am i never been one to use the yellow pages for my health care. Mm -hmm. Although for those of you who know what the yellow pages are. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Get those tinges of gray that gives it away, right? Not like David, though. Not like David. <laughs> yeah, let my fingers do the walking off at times. <laughs> so That's why they they nubs now. Some of them. <laughs> so, Josh, you're talking about some sort of strategic things. What do you see as far as some of the tactical things? Because it's you're talking about a big wheel to turn. Well, the only time you get to turn that wheel is when you have. <laughs> aligned political will and we have that and i'm really concerned we're going to waste it i'm watching us actively waste it there's too much infighting about you know in good faith people have these hypotheses about what's going to work what's not going to work what they're comfortable with what they think is realistic and a lot of those are rooted in what we've always done and a lot of them are rooted in uh, what we think is affordable when we had to like beg scrape and plead with executives to get any budget at all but you don't have to beg scrape and plead you know, to get 
Sarbanes-Oxley uh, compliance. Like you want to be in financial services, you have to do this. You want to be a publicly traded company, you have to do this. Just like with commercial restaurants, you don't want to pass minimum can't, kitchen sanitation, you can't be a restaurant. So I think unless and until this becomes table stakes, um, no wonder we're designing for the things that are affordable or the things that we're comfortable with. Instead, what I'm trying to ask is what do we need? Like what would keep people alive, uh, both in the short term, midterm and long term? And, um, and I haven't heard a lot of fresh thinking like that. And I'm nearing the point of like really stirring the pot. And maybe I'm going to start doing so on your show. Is that here, why you but, called us? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And look, I, I assume good faith. I'm just, um, but there's a lot of really intense arguments going on right now amongst different stakeholder groups. And we've got to find some common ground if we want to actually have an impact. So I'm assuming that we're going to be, have successful ransoms for the next 10, 15 years. Easy. So these aren't going away. So in a world with lots more predators taking advantage of their prey, how do you make sure that we uh, have fewer disruptions, shorter disruptions, less painful disruptions? You know, we recover more quickly or the things that fail aren't the things that are too important to fail. And we're just not talking that way. We're looking at every cybersecurity problem is at, uh, you know, everything's a cybersecurity nail and we're holding a cybersecurity hammer or how well, I said that backwards, right? When you're holding a hammer, everything <laughs> looks like a nail. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've been, talking to some of my four or five C alumnus and talking to people that helped me keep hospitals safe during the pandemic and, and looking at what kind of appetite Senator Warner has or Robin Kelly in Illinois has in the house and where they're thinking and what the existing levers of power are and where stimulus might come, where stick carrots and sticks might come. And there's just not a lot of common ground being found amongst the stakeholders. So I thought I'd just try a completely fresh, conversation with you on some uncomfortable things. So I know we already granted that there's record high financial strain. And we know that the American healthcare system is sick, independent mm -hmm. of cybersecurity. But this might be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back over and over and over if we don't find a way to internalize the, the costs and benefit, the risks of responsible connectivity. So to me, without memorizing or reading something, I'm going to try to do the best I can. There, I think there were five things I hinted at you that if you know if, if you were put in charge and you wanted to make hospitals as safe as possible, I'll I'll throw out five things. And they're gonna need explanation, especially the first one. It's a metaphor. But number one is um, let's assume that the hijackers can get on the planes like they did in 9-11, but let's make sure they don't get in the cockpit, right? Steel reinforced cockpit doors, made sure that like they can't turn these planes into missiles. So we're not getting rid of in initial investments and commercial fleets and stuff, but we have to know what the most time sensitive, life sensitive, critical path systems are that even if your hospital's ransomed, these things have to be safe and functioning. So I've been asking, what are the steel reinforced cockpit doors for healthcare? Number two, uh, not every hospital and not every region has equal risk. If you have ample alternative care in your city and the closure of one hospital for a ransom for six weeks can be diverted to next nearest proximal alternative care, great. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, if you're a rural or critical access care hospital and you're down, there is no proximal alternative care. And where minutes or hours matter, those need outsized assistance and outsized uh, investment to make sure that they don't go down. Because when they go down, really bad things happen for that community. And this should not feel like a third world country. Number three is we have to prioritize the assets. Like there are some very time sensitive, latency sensitive systems for heart, brain, pulmonary treatment. Or things that directly touch humans, where we're still running FDA recalled devices that aren't safe to run. We're still running Windows XP and unsupported end of life operating systems. We're running unpatchable equipment that can directly touch or kill people, or if their outages could affect those time sensitive things. So we need some sort of stratification of prohibited devices or unsafe devices that need to be mitigated or removed or incentivized, even with our cash for clunkers type ideas where there's federal stimulus to get rid of those most dangerous time sensitive, latency sensitive devices. Number four is uh, for the time being, we're gonna need more emergency response and relief, right? So more fire trucks. I'd like to have more fire prevention in the buildings, but for the foreseeable future, some combination of CISA, ASPR, FEMA need to make sure that when someone goes down from a cyber attack, that they have all hands on deck and we make sure it's not a six to 12 week outage, but maybe a six to 12 day outage. And 
that that kind of emergency relief and emergency response as a gap fill is really chunk three of Senator Warner's paper. Yeah. Response and recovery. And then number five, this is the uncomfortable part. As I said, we have more financial incentive and regulatory to have general accounting practices trusted and trustworthy than we do to keep people alive. Nobody's dying from Sarbanes-Oxley directly. And yet look at all the oversight and accounting and even legal consequences for CFOs. So what, this cannot be a charity and this cannot be something where the strength of your program and the safety of your patients depends on how good you are at arguing up the chain to beg for, and claw for executive support. This has to be a board level concern, an executive level concern with financial carrots and sticks. And unless and until it is, you know, we, sh- we shouldn't have the 7,000 hospitals have varied uh, levels of trustworthiness for when it comes mm-hmm. to public safety, human life. So, um, Every these mod, every one of these modern industries that has the potential to affect public safety, human life, have mandatory minimums, and this is no different. Will it raise costs? Sure, but it's really not just raising costs; it's identifying true costs and making sure the cost burden is placed in the right spots. And if this requires significant bailout from Congress or significant funding and stimulus, fine. But we got to figure out what's necessary to maintain trustworthy, resilient delivery of patient care when you need it, where you need it. And then figure out how to help people get from current state to desired state. So I said a lot of stuff there, but steel reinforced cockpit doors for the most sensitive systems, most life sensitive, and uh, prioritization of the right institutions, the right geographies that need outsized care. Let's not tolerate and walk past the most dangerous devices. Let's do something about the most dangerous devices. And uh, let's try to make... um, emergency relief in the meantime, while we build up mandatory minimums and the funding to meet those mandatory minimums. So there's a lot of competing truths in there, right? Well, there's one piece. Well, there's two uh, thoughts as you were going through them. One is with the cockpit door. Yeah. Yeah. We reinforced it, but you know what else? The rest of the people on the plane attack people now (laughs) when they misbehave. (laughs) So we have there's a lot as of adjustments. So- yeah, there's yeah, a lot of adjustments. As, as yeah. society, we have worked harder to limit an even attempt at that door. And people will go down fighting, keeping them from getting to that door. So bringing in, you know, yeah, we can do that. But we need the folks because, you know, if if they're just going to, you know, not argue with them, and let them blow open the door. So I really think that uh, a lot of the things that we're on about bringing everybody into the cybersecurity team, and that's a big thing we preach. But another thing that's very interesting is, uh, yes, there's got to be carrots and sticks. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, we can have mandatory minimums, just like I have a mandatory <laughs> A speed limit on I-16 going down to Savannah. But Mm -hmm. if you don't think the cops are there, nobody meets that speed limit. (laughs) If there's no enforcement funded, and and I mean like real enforcement, what does the minimum really get us? I mean, yeah, part of part of this argument when I'm not doing it 100 miles an hour is the uh, is the uh, the full regulatory package, right? Auditing. Carrots and sticks, penalties, et cetera. Yeah. And look, we have that for OCR. We have it for records, but we don't have it for safety. So but, like yeah, I said, but for the records, it's not enforced that strongly. Right. In fact, even less so because um, part of that public private partnership argued for what was it? Um, House resolution seven, eight, nine, eight. It, mm-hmm. You know, there's, if you've been trying a best practice and it didn't work, you can get forgiveness from the, uh, the you, Secretary get special, of you can get, and I tell people you would have gotten that consideration if you could prove you're trying. And the thing is, is we're having a hard time convincing people to be willing to prove they're trying. And all of these things were already, you could argue many of them are already in the regulations. They're just not specific and we need more specific and more targeted. I agree. Yep. But if it doesn't come with a stricter enforcement, I'm just, I don't know how much it'll help. Well, assume you can get a blank check. Like, let's start this conversation with you <laughs> yeah. can get a blank check from Congress. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, 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 I'm not saying you will, but assume you could. So stop saying, I don't have any money. I don't have any support. It's been a hard fight. Right. And you were probably, if you've been advocating for security for five years, 10 years, 15 years. Like you were right, but you were early. 
<laughs> so a lot of us have kind of found some like happiness in slavery where we're, we're, we've just kind of like resigned ourselves to that. It's never going to get better. This might be your moment to get better. So for a moment, assume you get a blank check. Now, one of the things I like to remind people, and it's an uncomfortable thing to say, but it's true. When you look at the way the U.S. government and the White House do critical infrastructure sectors, there's 16 of them, I double-checked. The healthcare and public health sector is the most ransomware disrupted of all 16 sectors. It has more disruptions, larger disruptions, longer disruptions, and it's the only one that's been tied to loss of life. So we are not doing well amongst the 16 peers, about amongst our peers in the 16 critical infrastructure sector. I concur. So within that, though, I think I can do this quickly, but because most people know those sectors exist, but they don't know there's these 55 things called national critical functions. And these are much smaller atomic units of risk. They're things like provide medical care or you turn the light switch on and, and electricity flows or clean drinking water. So there's 55 of those. There are four that affect the nation's hospitals. Those four are, by name, they're weird names, but by name, one of them is protect sensitive information. In the case of this sector, it means PHI, right? So protect sensitive information. Number two, maintain access to medical records. That's not the confidentiality of records. That's the availability of records. Number three is called provide medical care, which is the ability to get timely access to patient care where you need it, when you need it, at your local facility. And number four is called provide, excuse me, support community health which is like the broader public health planning and regional resilience um, and cascading effects. So those are the four things that cybersecurity can disrupt or attackers could disrupt. And when I took kind of a chronological lens at this, you know, before the High Tech Act and HIPAA provide electronic medical records, this sector basically enjoyed relative obscurity from ransom, uh, from bad guys in cyberspace. Upon the manifestation of harm for the confidentiality of record breaches, when these were done electronically and at scale, you saw Congress act and HHS OCR and the HIPAA rulings and and breach notifications responded to the first of our four NCFs. But over time, starting in 2016, you saw ransoms start to hit number three and four, right? The unavailability records and the delayed degraded patient care, starting with Hollywood Presbyterian going through WannaCry, not Petya, even before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, we saw the fourth of the four NCFs or national critical functions disruptive, which is that these already strained and stressed hospitals had cascading failures to other regions and counties affecting public health. So what you've seen is the attackers and impact have encroached from the first of the, of the four NCFs to all four, but regulatory has not. In fact, not only have we not added new regulatory responses to the disruptions of the other three, we've actually softened the one thing we did have, which was the OCR. So this is one of the reasons now that you're seeing bits and bites meet flesh and blood and the first proofs a lot of loss of life and various manifestations and arguments. There's willingness to do something, which is why you saw the Patch Act pass. I mean, that, that thing was nine years from conception through successfully passing into law. And I do not feel like taking nine more years here. There's a window no. to act on this. Question is, will we, or will we miss the mark? Well, and I, I, I... I see that will, and I want to make sure if we're going to put minimums in place that it requires, yes, the financial backing to help those who need it most. And, you know, sometimes you don't distribute the money the same way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, we've made it. It's pretty obvious those rural areas and the smaller entities, they're going to need more help. It just is. And and we need to address that and the FEMA and those things. And we did go through Warner's paper mm-hmm. with, you know, increasing payments. Mm-hmm. If you tie it to money, they do it. And I, to me, I love that piece about you get better payments if you can prove you're doing these cyber standards, because now I've got enforcement. Well, there's the there's the other the other hammer, though, right? It's not just a stick. Yeah. It's a hammer, which is maybe these minimum hygiene requirements make you eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Yeah. yeah and that not is being eligible hammer. is very bad. So in yeah. the case of, say, some of the House legislation drafts that have been kicking around for a couple of years, even before the pandemic, their idea was we need mandatory minimums to be eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. But recognizing that many people are below that poverty line, they're target rich but cyber poor, there were stimulus monies for, for hospitals under a certain size. Mm-hmm. So that 
yes, it's it's going to be expensive and we're going to help you pay for it. So that's why I said, if you have a blank checkbook, yeah, if we had the available talent pool. Now there's other problems in that. We don't have the available talent pool. Uh, I was about to say the talent yeah. pool, David can speak to just in being able to provide the resources from a technical knowledge mm-hmm. perspective to put those things in place and monitor and handle them is, is it's tough. And, in the rural environments, they've got the same problems. And that's why I don't think the regulation should be do all these alleged best practices that have no evidence that they work or they we hope that they work or we think that they work or we, we believe they might work. If we're going to tether reimbursement or eligibility or mandatory minimums to something, I think we should be very surgical, pun intended, on those time sensitive, latency sensitive services that cannot go down. So I think we're going to have, I'm going to say this again, we are going to have successful ransoms for the next 10 to 15 years easy. The question is, can we still perform our time-sensitive life safety functions during that attack? Can you fight through the pain? Have we put those steel reinforced cockpit doors around your heart, brain, pulmonary, or your EMR? In fact, one of the stunning things that's come out of a lot of these debates is everyone's talking about what hospitals should do or what medical devices to do should do. The central most important thing in the whole hospital is the EMR. And there's no one putting more pressure on trustworthy, resilient, maintainable electronic medical record systems right now. I don't know if it's because they have better lobbyists or because we're all don't feel like we have a sphere of control, but that is the thing that once it goes down, a lot of stuff stops. Mm -hmm. So there should be downtime procedures that can still maintain acceptable levels of care for heart, brain, and pulmonary in spite of a ransom attack. Yeah, and the well, we've got multiple layers. That is a conversation we've had many times about the importance of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so often, anybody that wants a first, yeah, everybody talks about HIPAA as if it's confidentiality. And I'm like, oh no, no, no. We we've got to worry about (laughs) what if you can't trust the data in the records? Yeah, and what if you can never get them again? And so those pieces are huge. And I think a lot of what's going on in that industry is where we had, you know, the certified health IT through ONC. There's this, we'll call it a belief that if you're certified, then you're doing all those things. And I think that that program needs a little bit more carrot and stick that, uh, that the vendors need to participate a little bit more than they do in making sure that security is managed. Yeah, I have um, through my cavalry work, through other things, even I got some of this language into the executive order after solar winds. I often talk, um, the philosopher in me often talks about our dependence on undependable things, right? So Mm -hmm. if, if, if you have something that can only handle like 50 pounds and you're, and you're putting a hundred pounds on it, like you're going to have a failure. So it's the relative dependence on and how dependable things are. And what that means is if you, if we are over dependent on undependable healthcare IT, then there's two choices. You can depend upon it less or you can make it more dependable. I've been doing both for most of my career, but your dependent should be proportional. So the line I got into the executive order, I think I'm going to do this from memory. It says in the end, the trust we place in our digital infrastructure should be proportional how trustworthy and transparent that infrastructure is and to the consequences we will incur if that trust is misplaced. There's a lot of stuff in there, but it's still talking about is our dependence proportional to consequence and proportional to trustworthiness. And I think we've done all the dependence part. We have not done the trust transparency or consequence part. And as those consequences continue to climb, you know, we're paying the piper one way or another. It's either in prevention or it's in closure. It's either. And I um, think education is really a big just I mean, the one small thing I've been dealing with and and these are people who want to do the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing. They had things in place. It's still going to happen. Just like you said, we're going to get hit. Yeah, they're going to keep getting better and they keep getting better. And so with that in mind. I also then still, even though I personally know I've tried to explain these things, but until you deal with it yourself, Mm -hmm. 
they don't understand it. And these are this gets back to having the C-suite understand, having them be involved. Mm -hmm. And that education piece at that level, do you know they still don't really teach cybersecurity importance or anything about privacy and security in medical school? They still barely teach it in software engineering school. I know. So if we're not teaching them where we're supposed to do education, um, you know, they don't teach it in business school. They don't teach it. If we're not getting the people besides us educated, I think that's a big piece of, I love the idea of the FEMA response. Definitely. I know the carrot stick, the locking things down. We've hit on those, but I think that we need to have a carve out specifically for education and enforcement. Yeah. And I want to be careful how I word some of these things, but there are some very passionate beliefs about what should be done from the sector perspective. And one of the maybe advantages or curses I have is I teach CISOs for Carnegie Mellon University's grad school. So I see CISOs come in, either want people aspiring to be a CISO or people that have been a CISO in, across all 16 sectors. So I get to see the general best practices in financial services versus discrete manufacturing versus oil and gas. And one of the most common treasured foundational controls in every sector is completely missing from the culture of healthcare. And that's uh, asset inventory. It doesn't mean it has to be perfect, but like the idea is you cannot defend what you do not know you have, right? First, know what you have. Second, know when it changes. And how do you do asset prioritization or impact analysis or hunting and things like that when you don't know what you have? And for some reason, that, that, First belief, that article of faith that every other successful risk management program sector has is just seems to be missing from healthcare. And number two is there seems to be a heavy focus on how we've been beat or how we're getting beat now. And that is very much fighting the last war and trailing indicators. There are so many open doors and windows on the first floor of these hospitals that how you've been hit so far is a description of the easy paths, not the only paths. And I keep looking at the front door of my house, the back door of my house, the side door, the basement door, and all the first floor windows. And there's like no no doors on the door frames. And if I were to say to you that everyone robbed in my neighborhood got robbed through the front door, if I added a front door to my front door frame, would it stop them from getting in the side door, the basement door, the back door? So we have a plethora of ways into the airplane. Yeah. The question is how to keep them out of the time sensitive stuff. And I think we aren't really thinking about the consequence-driven surgical approaches to resilience. Instead, we're thinking about how they happen to beat the defenses last time. I assume they're going to beat the defenses. Where's your like panic room or your bank vault? Where's the things that we put prioritize asset security or access control around? In the cockpit. And that better, you can't do that if you don't know what you have. Like, So mm-hmm. which of these systems are critical path for heart treatment? Which of them are critical treatment for stroke? Is it a rupture or a bleed? Because you got the golden hour or golden hours to to save brain and save life. Time is brain. Those are the things I think we need to, in the initial stages, focus our fire on mandatory minimums and the budgets to make sure that you, if if one hospital goes down, you don't have to go three plus hours and you probably won't survive the trip to the next nearest alternative care. And there's a lot more we'd have to do beyond that. But I want to make sure that on your worst day, from a ransom attack, you can still deliver time sensitive patient care. And that is, you know, always the hope. And what our message is constantly is patient care comes first. And our tagline is, you know, HIP is not about compliance, it's patient care. And and we really do, you know, the, think that these things are about caring for the patient because the damage done, even if it's just exposing their confidential information it can be very seriously damaging to their ability to get care Mm -hmm. and the care they receive could be absolutely. If I can't trust the record to it, actually have my conditions in it, my blood type, I've got a whole new problem. And so with so many people that, you know, we're looking at, and I guess what I'm, you, well, you have exposure to all of these other industries. I, I've been in healthcare yeah, since the 80s, and we'll just leave it at that. And 
So I don't know that they have or how they have or how they see things. The level of legacy devices, multiple different uh, systems that have to talk to each other. Every time you turn around, if the new technology comes in, yeah, we want to use this because it could save a life. But now I've got to put that in with all these things that are, you know, decades old that, oh, they're still working. Let me bring in that big C arm. And uh, I, I literally had somebody in an ASC say, we need you to figure out how to get things off this thing. And they roll it in. It's huge. And they show me a VHS tape is where they used to store things on it. Can you make it work with our cloud EHR? Well, <laughs> you know, there's that there's that old cliche that you're only as strong as your weakest link. And we yeah. tolerate a whole lot of weak links. I, I'd like to see a strong link. Like we mm -hmm. we've kind of just said, well, we can compromise for for this or we can compromise for that. There are ways to have more secure segmentation isolation. There are ways to introduce bulkheads like in a submarine. Like if you have one compartment fail, the whole ship doesn't sink. There's there's cost and benefit to every time you add a new feature of connectivity, and we should be very thoughtful about them. And I think uh, again, the the ones that are too time sensitive to fail is where I'm focusing my fire. And instead of trying to protect the hospital, here's another medical pun. If you only have enough penicillin to save 10 people, you don't sprinkle 10 penicillin dust over all thousand patients. None of them are going to get better, right? No. So how do you give a sufficient dose to the 10 that most need it? And we're not thinking like that. Like we're not in a place at the moment to do idyllic best practices or hypotheticals. We're at a time right now where we're having lots of failures. How do we reduce the frequency, duration, and impact of those failures for the time-sensitive stuff so we don't lose more patients and we don't lose more hospitals. So it's the hair on fire scenario, more or less, and how can we put out as many fires as possible simultaneously with those <laughs> uh, the with yeah. some minimums in place? It's it's funny, you know. I just did a, a, a podcast right before the fourth, and now I'm doing one with you right after. With that one during the podcast, he was it was uh, Dale Peterson. He's fantastic for industrial controls. He, it's kind of, I think it's called unsolicited response. He runs the S four conference. He was kind of lovingly giving me a hard time about the S bomb work and about the Patch Act uh -huh. because those things may take ten years to finally fully matriculate into healthcare now that they're they're passed forward. Because it takes a long time to buy new equipment and rotate out the old equipment. So it could be 10, 15 years before we get the full benefits. And that's just so far out there. It's not helping anybody right now. Mm -hmm. But during the course of that conversation, I think he started to realize and later wrote a blog post that if you don't start those 10 to 15 year things now, we're in, we're in worse shape 10 to 15 years from now. Exactly. How do, how and do you, you got to <laughs> help people put out fires now. So to me, I think I'm working on fire building codes, you know, fire oh, prevention yeah, yeah. building codes <laughs> and yeah. more fire trucks in the immediate sense and battlefield triage of treating the most urgent uh, patients first. And I, I think if we don't have a scrappy attitude of not what's perfect eventually or not what's tactical firefighting now without ever doing fire prevention, we need a healthy balance mm -hmm. of prevention and response. And uh, I'm just not hearing it right now. I'm hearing what's cheap, what's easy, what's what's well, doable. And, yeah. You not know, what's there's, effective. There's some cases that over the years where I know when I'm dealing with people that are dollars and cents and that's all that matters. And uh, how many dollars are they making when they're closed? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, no. Their decision-making process mm -hmm. is about, and and that's really what I'm getting at is yeah. decision-making and making decisions. Everything's related to dollars and cents and, you know, all of these other things. And, and yes, they generally are, they may be successful for a period of time, but their intent is to unload it and get their money and get out. Mm -hmm. And in healthcare, it's getting so that that attitude, I believe, in some segments, you know, really took over. If you see, if you go back and look at, you know, prior to high tech, the reason we weren't hit is the vast majority of the industry wasn't fully digitized. Right. The data wasn't there. And you're right. That's, you know, data rich, cyber poor. I mean, our Target, data is rich, wide and deep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So uh, it's definitely one of those cases where 
you have to rely on the fact that for the most part, the people that I work with on a daily basis, they've got to worry about the dollars and cents, but ultimately patient care is what matters. But it's the ones who are out there doing the care that tend to recognize that sooner and more richly than others. And as we work together, all of us who have to figure out how to save people and save hospitals, saves people. And, you know, having, you know, do- if you have a hospital, but you don't have doctors and nurses in it, it's just an empty building. Right. So, I mean, there's so many layers that we have to work with to save and have access to that the technology is the way we're going to continue to do this. And I didn't look at when we started recording, so I don't know. We're probably close to where you'd like to wrap up, but maybe to have a a moment of despair with the silver lining of maybe some hope. Yeah. That closure from St. Margaret's, that that recognition and acknowledgement that Ransom played a part, even if a a minor part, but a contributing part in the closure of yet another hospital made my blood boil. And it demoralized me knowing that we'd been indifferent to how many other hundreds of rural hospital closures, but sometimes like it's darkest before the dawn. And while there's a part of me that says, why am I extolling the importance of cybersecurity for healthcare? When it looks like at times, no one cares about healthcare proper. Like if you don't care about healthcare, uh, why are you going to yeah. care about the cyber of healthcare? Except that this new accelerant, this new man-made hazard, this new man-made hazard that on demand can shut down a hospital it may be enough to change the the public policy conversation to fix it all, right? Not to fix everything. We're going to get past all the partisan things in public, private medicine, Mm -hmm. but sometimes it takes a new free radical, a new element to really recast the discussion. And if this hospital closure to ransomware can shine a brighter light on how many rural hospitals are closing overall, we may be more in a situation, not about putting some constraints on, what individuals hospitals do, but this might be like a bailout kind of a moment, like a save Detroit, save the airlines. But like we cannot allow us citizens to go hours uh, uh, to get timely access to patient care. This is starting to feel like a third world country. So I, I intend to take this really dark and sobering moment of rural closures everywhere as a chance to really fire up even more political. Well, that we do something that what that means though, is we better be ready with really meaningful ideas and an appetite to accept some change because incremental change is not going to fix this. We've had material risk introduction and harm introduction. We need material changes in response. If you sound incremental, you're probably not doing it right. So I want to hear bold ideas, critical thinking, open minds, and everyone's coming at this in good faith, but we have to have the hard conversations and recognize that even if we're right about our one point, sometimes the opposite of a profound truth is another profound truth. We're in the point now where we've got to wrestle with some hard stuff. Mm-hmm. And it may, in fact, create some political will to fix or shore up these rural hospitals from all hazards, not just the cyber one. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out to come on. You're right. We have to have these conversations and so often everybody wants to just write it off and oh um, we literally have you know we're insured for that okay not for long (laughs) not for long (laughs) let me tell you something you could say you're insured i'm looking at a scenario the more things are changing because everybody got their insurance money that was going to get it you know in 2019 2020 maybe even 2018 but If you take that approach today, the way I see it, you're going to need to be self-insured for these things is more or less it. And who's going to do that, right? Who's going to sock away that cash to be able to handle that? You're right. The cash isn't there. So we do have to find new ways because the problem's not going away. It's just like we said, we have to accept we're going to get hit. You're definitely mm-hmm. going to get hit, but that's what resilience is versus security. And nobody gets this. They yes. think it's a, mm-hmm. a, a, a substitute, like just a s- synonymous. They're not. I mean, resilience is, can you take a punch? 
can you get up quickly running. when you get knocked down? Can you fight mm-hmm. through the pain? Chumba like, Wumba. <laughs> oh, please don't do that to me. <laughs> but yeah, that that is is that the, the anthem of uh, resilience. But um, yeah, there you go. It's a it's even about regional resilience. Even if yours goes completely down, do you have proximal alternative care to to fill in? Can you it's respond? It's a bigger quickly? picture than yeah. so many people treat it. And we again, these are all conversations. We had a whole episode on let's stop talking about security and talk about resilience. Good for you. Be- yeah, because what the heck, you Josh? Because <laughs> we agree that it's. This is not something anymore where you're just trying to keep people from looking at records. That's not what it is anymore. Right. We're trying to care for patients. And that's so often not the way people see it. But we're working hard on our part to spread the message. And and I use my, my whole new thing of... You know, privacy and security is not a, uh, it's a chronic condition you treat, not a project you complete. That's a nice phrase. That That's my thing. If I can ever remember to say it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the way I want us to approach it is it has a much broader impact than what so many people have always treated it like. Yeah. And patient care is seriously impacted. And we've got to address that and also look at the impact to the business. You know, you're in a room and you ask a, a room full of uh, physicians practices, you know, how many of you say your disaster recovery plan is we're going to go to paper and like hands raised. And I'm like, what part of that plan addresses the fact that probably three quarters or more of your staff has never used paper oh, as I know, their day-to-day I know, way. I know. You know, and how are you going to get that paper back into the system once you're done? And how are you going to get bills paid when you only have it on paper? And it's like, oh, wait. Well, I mean, maybe I'll have to come back again sometime soon. But uh, larger <laughs> under those five things I told you, there's tons more detail. And one of them is we don't have standards of care for patient informed patient consent when you've been compromised. We don't have a rate of mm-hmm. established ratio that if pre pre uh, hyperconnected medical devices the nurse to patient ratio is you know 1 to 3 and now because of technology it's 1 to 10 like if you have been compromised you should have a mandatory census reduction proportional yeah. to so like there's a bunch of informed consent things missing and standards of care definitions missing that are also underneath that overall framework but we took the adoption and the benefits of hyperconnectivity we're starting to see the costs and we've got to reckon with that and we got to do it soon. It's and, a bold new frontier. Yeah, unfortunately, um, the attackers figured it out faster than the defenders and and we moved. And they really keep doing slow. it. Right. Yeah. Right. It reminds me of that cartoon I sent Don on the other day. It was a lady was talking about, hey, have you heard about this new chat GPT thing? We've got to get this thing instituted. We don't know anything about it. We don't know what the risks are. We don't know what the negative impact can be. And then the it could C- end the species, but yeah, yeah. And then the CEO says, well, "What do we know about it? We know we need to get it in done quickly." <laughs> right. That's it. That's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, um, I don't even know why I'm saying this, and maybe you can cut it if it doesn't flow. But we should probably wrap up. <laughs> I have a call coming any second. But yeah. I used to say when someone says I can't patch this, like you know, you know how disruptive it is to patch, you know, clinical uh, operational equipment. And uh, I said, I'm pretty sure it's disruptive. I'm pretty sure the only thing worse than planned change management and downtime is unplanned for weeks. Yeah. And now when I was saying that it was about patching like an, a, a known exploited vulnerability in the wild, I was having that conversation. But now it's like the only thing worse than paying for security or paying the rent or, or being down for six weeks is being down for good. And it's mm-hmm. not a happy parallel I'd like to draw here. No. The, no. The, the, the sphere of impact is growing or in orders of magnitude. And that is not hyperbole. It's observable. And we got to do something about it. History has its eyes on us. And I want to make sure we're being bold. Yeah. Well, you know, we've all got to get out there and participate and discuss these things. And thanks for reaching out and having this discussion. I, I think it was a wonderful discussion. And we'll see how much trouble we stir up. But, uh, you know. Troublemaker is three. I, I count three. Let's uh, <laughs> keep, keep doing yeah. the good troublemaking. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Josh. And uh, come back and see us sometime. Thank you.
Yeah. Thanks again. All right, folks, that's our show for today. Remember to share this out with everybody that's on your social media list and email list and any other type of spam list you send out. <laughs> Remember for Donna and myself, as well as Josh, that uh, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims, the show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.